ahead and get started with session two. Welcome to the updates in hematology. Along with my program co-directors, co Dr. Stevens and Dr. Malley, thank you so much for joining us today. I am Becky Champion. I'm the clinical pharmacy manager here at Norton Cancer Institute, and I will be your moderator for program two. Each of the four sessions will be 15 minutes of presentation, followed by up to five minutes of questions and answers. For virtual participants, please submit your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. For in-person attendees, raise your hand for our microphone runners to come to you, so your questions will be heard by our virtual audience and on the recording. After today's event, you will receive an email with the evaluation link to complete for continuing education credits. We will begin with Dr. Joseph Flynn presenting chronic lymphocytic leukemia updates. Dr. Flynn is Chief Administrative Officer, Norton Medical Group, and Physician-in-Chief, Norton Cancer Institute. Dr. Flynn served in several capacities with The Ohio State University prior to accepting the lead role with Norton Cancer Institute, including co-director, division of hematology, medical director at the James Cancer Network, Arthur James Cancer Hospital, and Richard Solop Research Institute, and Associate Professor of Medicine at the School of Public Health. Dr. Flynn earned his undergraduate degree from Skidmore College and an MBA from Babson College. He is a graduate of the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he received a Master's of Public Health degree from Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. He has been extremely active in the community on a wide variety of cancer-related topics and has remained a dedicated advocate in the study of adolescent and young adult cancers. Dr. Flynn has contributed to more than 100 medical publications. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Flynn. All right, thank you. All right. Now, a question for you. Is it because Joe Malley didn't start off that the seats aren't full? Because he puts butts in the seats. It's amazing. Well, thanks for being, th thank you to Dr. Champion, Dr. Stevens, Dr. Malley, the directors. Uh, and I, I do want to give a, a thanks to everyone in the, the, the back of the room doing the AV stuff, Daniel, Eric, et cetera. Thank you, Karen Bussey and the team, Sandra Stroud. Lauren White. It, it takes a lot of work, as you can imagine, to do this program. So really humbled to be able to be here. I'm going to go quickly because I know t time is of the essence. No disclosures. Um, start off with the case report. Ms. F is a 62-year-old female, no past medical history, comes in with a CBC, normal hemoglobin platelets, but a white count of 56,000. Physical exams, benign, no adenopathy, no hepatosplenomegaly. And the question is, how do you approach this patient? Now, I'm not going to embarrass people by raising who would treat and who wouldn't because they're going to watch for the first person and half will raise and half won't. But the question is really, should we treat? And if we do, with what? So um, my answer is I wouldn't treat. I would actually do watchful waiting. And I start off with this slide. And in my career, I will tell you that more people have pulled the trigger too early than waiting. And there's, there's plenty of data showing that if you treat before they have symptoms, and before you have real indications, and we'll talk about that in a second, that you will actually do worse for the patient. And so, um, however, when you do that, it's really tricky, right? The patient's coming in, you say, Ms. Ms. F, you have cancer, and we're going to watch you. And they think, Is, uh, where do I get a second opinion? So it's a real tricky thing, but it's a matter of having that discussion. And having spoken in CLL topics um, in other places with, with patient groups and stuff, and one gentleman got up there, he was an elderly gentleman, he said, yeah, Dr. Flynn, um, you watch, we wait, right? And you have to remember that as a patient. So how do you contribute to that? How do you have that discussion? But I'll be going back to this during the course of um, the discussion. And there's another area we'll touch on is just lone cytopenias. How do we approach the patient that you would see that they have an indication because they have cytopenias, but do you really take on CLL-directed therapy or not? And then we'll talk a little bit about indications and certainly how do we treat. So some background so everyone's uh, grounded. Median age is 70 to 72. And as I listened to Dr. Stevens and, and Dr. Pagan and the group around um, treatment in myeloma, I think we really have to think about this. If you think the median age is 70, 72, and the, now the median survival in the United States is 76-ish. It went down from 78. So you really do need to package that into your decisions for am I going to treat and with what? And then do I do uh, concomitant treatment? Do I do serial treatment? Do I watch? As I was listening to those talks, my dad had myeloma, and we took him off therapy, and he ended up going five years without requiring therapy. Now, the book answer would have been to treat him. And so I think you really need to look at that and figure what is the best way to approach that. Um, 
most people are asymptomatic at diagnosis. So they come in, it's, there's a culture counter in every street corner, so people get diagnosed with CLL, and it's um, an important thing. And then most people, and I think this is important, most people die of something else. So actually, if you look at the data, and you do look at the SEER data, that most people die of heart disease with CLL. Now that goes with, right, it's more commonly in males, the median age is 72, most people die of heart disease in this country, you have a dis disease that may not even um, require treatment. So um, the, um, it's important as we look uh, at that patient and we're doing watchful waiting and we're, we're counseling them properly, is to think about those other things, the risk for infections, the need for vaccinations, and certainly the high risk of secondary malignancies. So people with CLL will have up to a 40-fold increased risk of skin cancer. And those are important things to watch out for. Later on, Dr. Jung will be talking about some cutaneous uh, cancers. And, but this group is important, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So um, it's tough for me to talk about flow cytometry when we have an expert in the room. But really suffice to say that you're looking at CD5 expression of CD19, DIM expression of CD20, and expression of CD23. And really, that's the basic um, uh, flow that needs to be looked at. There's certainly myriad other, other studies that we do. And um, there's, it depends on where you're at and what, if you go to Ohio State, we have a slightly different panel than Neil Kay had at Mayo or the different areas. And a lot of that is because of research under underlying uh, uh, goals. So as we look at CLL, Mrs. Jones is diagnosed. The question is, what do you need to do from a testing standpoint? We all understand about um, the cytogenetics of CLL, and this gives you, there's four common variants, uh, deletion of 13Q, which is a good risk mutation, uh, deletion in 11Q, 17P deletion, and trisomy 12. And you can read the slide for yourself, but there are various levels of breakout. It's important to understand that when you do testing, we'll talk about that, is that there's something called clonal evolution. So we do look at that repeatedly over time. And generally speaking, I repeat that as I'm making a change in their treatment status. So if we have somebody who's advanced, I will repeat the, the test just to see if they haven't had clonal evolution to a more uh, negative uh, genetic alteration. So when do you do, when do you get testing? If you're going to put somebody on a clinical trial, the answer's a little different. Usually we do that up front because they want to risk stratify and have a better sense of what you're, when you're seeing results, what that looks like. But I don't typically get that until I'm initiating therapy. Because I think as you're doing it early, if you, many patients, you can go years and years. I told you 30 people never ever require treatment, that you will have to repeat that. And the, really, it's a prognostic. These are prognostic markers let you know time to treat intervals, and you'll have a sense of survivability. But that doesn't necessarily change right now. We don't use that to say, I'm going to initiate treatment. Um, looking at your, when, when I do finally test, I'll do a, a fish evaluation for um, a CLL panel, which will look at those uh, alterations I spoke about. But really focusing on 17P and then doing um, karyotype for T50, TP53 mutation analysis. We do know there's some discordance between those two tests. And um, it's important to understand that. And then the IGVH mutation status and people that are mutated have a better prognosis than those who are unmutated. Now, as far as imaging, and oftentimes I'll have patients come to me and you'll see they'll get CT scans, they'll get PET scans. And it, really, I don't tend to rely on them unless I'm concerned with somebody that they have a lot of uh, palpable adenopathy that I'm concerned about. They're having symptoms that may be related to adenopathy. And certainly, if I'm worried about a Richter's transformation. So, if there's nothing else you hear today, and this is um, really important, is when do you start therapy? And oftentimes, people will, will start a little too soon as I, I spoke to. But first and foremost, I believe that everybody should be offered a clinical trial if there's an opportunity. There's not a single cancer patient I would see without saying, do we have a trial that's available that's going to benefit the knowledge of disease, benefit the patient, whatever. But if it's, if it's an open trial, that's first and foremost. And I think that it's very, it's vital. The reason we're able to talk about all these great treatments in the, if, in the myeloma group as well is because of clinical research, very important. And then it comes down to do you have significant disease-related symptoms, fatigue, drenching night sweats, right? Every patient says, yes, I have, I'm a little verklempt, I have a little bit. No, I'm talking, you wake up, your night clothes are drenched. Um, unintentional weight loss. 
right? Not when people go and said, oh, I had my stomach banded and I lost a lot of weight. Am I in trouble? No, you had your stomach banded. It's, it's have you had unintended weight loss in greater than 10% over the previous six months? And then fever without infection. So it's usually fever 101 degrees over days. Now people who come in and go, yes, I've been running 99. Normally I'm 97. 101, 38 degrees centigrade, that's the temperature over a couple days, okay? Um, th threatened end organ function, progressive bulky disease, um, progressive anemia, we'll talk about the cytopenias, and then steroid refractory autoimmune cytopenias. That's when you'll get into the disease specific therapies. I'm going to take a second. Prognostic models, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of literature out there. I don't tend to use it. It gives you a sense of when you're going to be treating, but there's not a lot that it oftentimes confuses things because you're not going to necessarily pull the trigger because of, of this. You're really going to be looking at it like, okay, I have a sense of when you will likely need to have therapy. But each time the person comes in, you're taking a new snapshot, and that is what you have, right? Projecting into it, um, it's not wrong to do it, but I try to use my clinical acumen and really think about that. So I'll have people that have a white count over 100,000. Now, most people, if that one person went to the emergency room, the only one who knew how nervous that emergency room doctor is is the doctor themselves and the person who does their laundry because it would be, they'd be freaking out, right? 100,000, what do I do? I tend to watch as long as they're having no, none of these other symptoms. So um, first, no indication for treatment, clinical trial, watchful waiting, and then support, supportive care, age-appropriate cancer treatment, or screening, pardon me, uh, annual dermatologic evaluation, and then make sure they're vaccinated, and that in, does include COVID um, vaccinations. Avoid live vaccines, because these people are, are immunocompromised and it could be problematic. So just quickly on, um, it's not infrequent you'll get a patient with CLL who'll come in, they'll have an isolated cytopenia. So maybe they have a, an anemia, hemoglobin less than 10, maybe their platelets are under 100, and you think, okay, I'm gonna start off with my disease-specific or disease-related treatment. And I would just caution you to step back and look, is this related to autoimmune process? These patients have high propensity for autoimmune cytopenias. So then you do your, and I won't go through this in depth, but you go through your standard workup for autoimmune hemolytonemia, ITP, um, cholagglutin disease, and you make an assessment based on that. And then if, if you do uh, feel that it's related to that, then you treat it for that. So for instance, a mig, a mig per kilogram of of steroids um, for, for hemolytic anemia over the course of months. After the first month, I tend to then titrate, titrate down and make sure the counts are okay. And same with ITP, as long as they're not having um, serious bleeding or, or uh, compromise. Again, I, I tend to go to the steroids first. Yes, steroids treats everything, so it does have an impact. It actually treats 17P independent disease, and so it, it would impact on CLL as well, but you're really trying to impact on the cytopenias. Again, going back to age, median age of 70 to 72, you're trying to get yourself time so that they um, live a, a, a normal life otherwise. So jumping to case two, 69-year-old gentleman, three years history of CLL, stable counts, asymptomatic, presents today with drenching night sweats and subjective fevers. CBC is notable for the white count of 29,000, absolute lymphocyte count of 25,000, hemoglobin's less than 10, and platelets are 88,000. Other labs are normal. This is the meat of the matter, right? This is where, now you've made the decision here, hopefully you listened to a couple earlier slides where we said drenching night sweats, right? They've got two cytopenias there, um, and they've got fevers. So. Um, so what treatment course now? And again, I'm not gonna ask for volunteers, but this is the key part of what we're gonna be doing. So, and, and then what are the questions you really need to ask first? So I already alluded to part of that is like, what other tests do I need to do? Now I'm thinking about treating this person. So I do wanna risk stratify them with fish panel and looking at um, carry type, et cetera. But those are some of the key parts. At least it'll give me a sense of, of how we direct therapy. Um, but I think a couple questions you have to ask yourself otherwise. Can I use chemo, chemo immunotherapy? You know, what are the, the options, and we'll talk about those, and should I continue, consider continuous versus limited duration? And a lot of people utilize that, and, and you, you'd ask a patient. Um, I, I think it really depends on what their life is like, and some people think if I get a year's worth of treatment, I'd rather that than to take a pill for, for years in, in the future. So this beautiful slide um, really just goes through some of our new targets and 
there's, this is really exciting. You, you, Dr. Stevens talked about the, the myeloma journey, but we had a similar journey. And these are targets, whether it's a, a, a B cell receptor, BTK, PI3 kinase, et cetera. And there's a lot of different options out there in, in growing. Um, these are the, the FDA approved drugs that are available now, and they're in the slides that you'll all get. Um, really, I think that as you look at some of these things, whether they're the, the BTK inhibitors or an monoclonal antibodies as we've advanced them, um, it really has been an exciting uh, time to be a CLL focused provider. The future is really exciting as well, whether we're getting into CAR T and some of these other uh, new novel targeted uh, areas. So this is kind of the summary slide in the middle of the talk or partway through the talk. Um, as you're picking your first agent, really there's no great data saying starting with a BCL2 um, inhibitor versus using a BTKI um, that there's going to be improved outcome. People are st this is still incurable disease, and that's important. What you're really trying to do is tailor it what the patient needs, what symptoms you're worried about, things you're concerned about. So for instance, somebody with bulky adenopathy and a lot of it, you may want to, to avoid the, the venetoclax with a benetuzumab up front because tumor lysis. So just something to think about. There's ways it's dosed to try to prevent that, but things to con consider. Um, I think that uh, when you're looking at using the BTKIs, Certainly with the 17P deleted patient, there's advantages to that long term. There's some data showing that prolonged continuous use offers some benefit to patients. Um, if you're having an 11Q uh, deletion in a patient, how does that go in? People that have adenopathy or 11Q, sometimes the chemoimmunotherapy, especially if they're young and don't have deleterious mutations, can benefit from that. And then PI3 kinase inhibitors later on, again, I think those for a lot of the, the toxicity issues are, are falling out of favor up front for sure, but they, they should be kept in your armamentarium and, and there's a lot you can do. Um, I'll quickly go through this. Jen Wyack showed this back um, some years ago, New England Journal article looking at ibrutinib versus chemoimmunotherapy. And this is really where we started to see, okay, th th this is an amazing new class of compounds to treat people with CLL. Um, Dr. Stevens was a, a, a author on the Resonate trial, I think it was published in 2015, New England Journal, people over age 65, and again, a really important time to look and see that you have this agent that is very impactful. This is a, a follow-up study from last year looking at the Resonate 2 data eight years out, and I just want to point out a couple things. So at seven years, progression-free survival in this group was 59% in the ibrutinib group versus 9% in clarambacil. Now you can sit there and say, well, clarambacil doesn't have um, complete remissions and there's no survival advantage. I get it, but that was the standard that the FDA asked to compare against. Very important um, data. If you look at the 11Q and the IGVH unmutated, still really great response. And something that's really, at seven years, the um, overall survival is 78% in this population when you look, you tease that out, and 42% remained on, on ibrutinib. So when you think of that, again, people over age 65, and when I look at this historically, if you look at studies in CLL for the longest time, the median age of the trials were like in the 50s. Well, here you had this population that's mostly older people, and most of the data comes from young people. So these, this study was a really a great example for that. Um, again, long term, really focus here is looking at the color of the slide, the side effects, hypertension, AFib, infection, bleeding, are all toxicities of ibrutinib that you need to be considered and should go into as you're looking to, um, to treat. I think because of that, most subject experts have veered away from ibrutinib now, front line, and gone to things like acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. Um, Again, this just gives a historical thing. Is more for you having in your in your slides, um, and this is a continuation. So I do want to stop in January of 23. FDA approves zanabrutinib. Uh, this is work by Jen Brown and the Dana Farber group, and and really gives you a, a sense of um, there was an improvement. This actually compares head to head with ibrutinib, and there was an improvement in pro progression free survival, and I think that's really vital. So, this is really important. Really, if you look at that and then add into the fact that there's fewer cardiac adverse events, uh, I think that that's one reason why you would go to um, something such as this. So, 
um, colorful slide kind of giving my, my perspective on pe people that are previously untreated, test for a TP53 mutation and do CLL fish. If they have a disruption, then it's the uh, brutin tyrosine kinase inhibitor, dealer's choice, plus or minus a benetuzumab. I believe in probably single agent, although there is some data in the recent uh, ASH in December with ACAL using a benetuzumab, and there, there was some improvements in um, performance. Um, but certainly consider a clinical trial. This is a high-risk group. For those that don't have, uh, they have no 17P or any uh, P53 disruption, um, and they're IGVH mutated, so the good risk group, venetoclax or BTKI, I think, um, are, are both appropriate. And as I say below there, does the patient prefer fixed versus continuous? And then if they have IGVH unmutated, Again, the same combinations. It will show some data with ibrutinib and venetoclax here in a second. So um, quickly, for those that are on a BTKI and specifically ibrutinib, if they have intolerance, whether it's side effects, they've had progression, what do you do? You manage the side effects. You can switch to another um, BTK inhibitor or switch to a different class of drugs. Um, this, this is um, the GLOW study, and I think it's an important study. It looked at using ibrutinib plus venetoclax in uh, first-line treatment with, uh, with CLL. And I think you can see here um, excellent better responses. And importantly, as we look at, and, and Dr. Christensen talked about uh, MRD, but undetectable MRD in both bone marrow and peripheral blood was increased over the clarambacil benetuzumab. So it is an option that has shown efficacy in it. It's resulted in um, undetectable MRD. We don't really, we don't really incorporate uh, UMRD yet into our, our community clinical choices. Usually still those are, are um, experimental issues. So looking at side effects, the side effect profiles, I think that uh, I've already spoken to this, but um, some of our newer agents tend to be better tolerated. So last case, 70-year-old male, five-year CLL, um, no uh, untoward deletions, uh, mutated um, IGVH. Again, indications for treatment, treated with BTKI for two years. What should we consider now and how do we treat? Um, so jumping to that, if they haven't had BTK or venet venetoclax, just follow what we just talked about in the frontline algorithm. Now, if they have had a BTK, um, why was it stopped? If it's toxicity, right, you need to know that you can continue on. If it's progression, you can use a different uh, BTK or venetoclax. If they had venetoclax and a benetuzumab, again, what was the toxicity? If there was toxicity, and that's why you stop, treat with the BTK. Progression, you can uh, treat as well. Uh, or if you just, they, it's more than a year out, like in this gentleman, then you can, and if it's a long time out, you can retreat or you can go back to a BTK inhibitor, plus or minus a benetuzumab. And then if they've, if you've done BTK and venetoclax sequentially, which you may have, a lot of these patients are multiple treated, then you, I, I still, clinical trials, strongly preferred, and uh, a non-convalent BTK, uh, if available, or a combination um, using a, a brutinib with a venetoclax. So I'm gonna just finish up here. We're not gonna go into CAR-T. There's people in the room far smarter than I am on this. But this is an agent, I think, or, or a treatment that is something that's really coming to the fore. I think certainly some of the early work in the CD19 ver uh, version caused some issues around um, hypogammaglobinemia, which caused a lot of bad outcomes. But there's a lot of things that are being done, whether they're pre-treating with ibrutinib or other agents to en enhance that. But there's, uh, I think this is something that we should be looking at. We have trials available on CAR-T, but also I think that this is going to be um, the future. As, as um, Dr. Cho said, aloe transplant is still curative and it's still out there available. Um, it's, uh, wait, you can do a whole talk on when do you refer to that and when do you not. But I just wanted to put this in here because this is something that should be considered. So summary, don't rush to treatment needlessly. Assess for autoimmune cytopenias, and then um, you're gonna base your treatments based on um, certainly their, their risk category from a genetic standpoint. And um, I, I, again, I wanna thank our research team. I, I wanna thank our nurses and our infusion nurses. They do God's work in our world. Like, they really keep the trains going. So I really appreciate all that's done. Really, really great things. And I thank everyone for participating today. And we'll stop if any questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Flynn. Do we have any questions for Dr. Flynn, either in the room or virtual? All right, you answered them all. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Stevens has a question. So the question was, we had a lot of work around COVID and certainly um, how does CLL and COVID-19, you know, what is the crossing? I'm a big fan of the vaccine. I've been vac vaccinated myself. Uh, for anyone who's immunocompromised like we see in CLL, I think it's really important that they remain vaccinated. I think that that is a key part that the, um, as, as you look across the, the globe, the patients with CLL are profoundly at risk for bad outcomes when they had COVID. People were in general, but certainly going forward, we've seen an iterative, an iterative effect over time with, with COVID and CLL. But I think it, in this day and age to not vaccinate a CLL patient for, for COVID would be a, a wholly um, bad thing to, to admit. So um, there's a lot of controversy in saying that, but I have no qualms in saying that for, and I can be quoted on that. that, that this, it'd be wrong to not vaccinate somebody unless they have some other contraindication. So thanks for the question. All right, thank you. Thank you. We will now con continue with session 2B, pediatric updates presented by Dr. William C. A medical graduate of the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Medicine, Dr. C obtained his PhD in genetics at Yale University. He did research in immunology at Stanford University before completing residency training at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford and fellowship training in pediatric hematology oncology at Boston Children's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Dr. C served as an attending in stem cell transplantation at Northwestern University and Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago before joining the University of Louisville and Norton Children's Hospital in 2018 to become Director of Pediatric Blood and Marrow Transplantation. Dr. C's research interests focus on the development of novel cellular therapies for childhood malignancies and genetic diseases. He is supported by grants from the Kentucky Pediatric Cancer Research Trust Fund to develop cellular immunotherapy to treat childhood leukemias and solid tumors. We are grateful to have him at Norton Children's Cancer Institute. Welcome, Dr. C. Good afternoon, and, and uh, uh, first I'd like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to, to discuss with you today. Um, okay, the uh, focus of the discussion today would be on chimeric antigen, uh, antigen receptor T, uh, T cell therapy or CAR T therapy. And do I move? Yes. Got it? Yes, I have no con uh, conflict of interest to disclose. Today's discussion will, will be threefold. One, we will review the uh, real world experience of CAR T therapy in pediatric and young adult B cell ALL. And two, an e evaluation of the clinical uh, predictors of relapse after CAR T cell therapy in uh, pediatric ALL. And then a third, a discussion of the case of dual CD19 and CD22 directed CAR T therapy. By now, everybody should be familiar with CAR T therapy, which stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. It is a new form of uh, 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 leukemia treatment. In which, in which a patient's own immune cells are re-engineered to express a novel receptor that enables the T cells to recognize and kill leukemia cells. CAR T th therapy has been shown to be a highly effective treatment that can bring into remission some resistant form of pediatric leukemia. The, this figure shows the structure of a chimeric antigen receptor. A fragment derived from a monoclonal antibody that, is rec that recognizes a, a leukemia antigen, for example, CD19, is uh, fused with an activation domain of a, a signaling receptor derived from T cell. Using molecular genetics technique, the CAR protein is engineered to express on the surface of a patient's own T cells. The CAR expression T cells would then seek out leukemic cells that bears the CD19 antigen and kill them. 
this figure shows the, uh, uh, the workflow of the CAR T cell therapy. After a patient is identified as a candidate for the therapy, T cell will be collected from the patient. The T cell will be sent to a manufacturing faculty, uh, facility to be processed to express the, the chimeric antigen receptor, which will take about four weeks. When the CAR T cells are ready, the patient will, re will receive a mild form of chemotherapy followed by infusion of the CAR T cells. And after the T cells are infused, they will seek out leukemic cells and destroy them. The first commercial CAR T therapy was approved in 2017 by the FDA, basing on a promising results from the landmark Eliana study, a phase two clinical trial that looked at 63 pediatric patients with relapsed or refractory B cell ALL. In the Eliana study, the CAR T therapy achieved a complete remission rate of 83%, and with a 12 month event, event free survival of 50, 50% of those. Uh, around that number, indicating that CAR TC therapy can lead to durable response in many patients. The results of the Eliana study is impressive, but one important question is, when used outside the context of a clinical trial, would CAR T cell work just as well? The group headed by Schultz et al has published a paper which is an attempt to answer this question. The Real World CAR-T the th Therapy Consortium is a, is, is a group of 15 pediatric cancer centers formed to study patients who have received commercially available CAR-T therapy outside the setting of a clinical trial. They collected data on 185 patients who has received commercial CAR-T therapy against the uh, CD19 antigen and analyze the data for patient survival and toxicity. The curve on the right side of the figure represents e event-free survival of the patients. The curve has a sh sharp drop in at, the, at time zero to 85%, which represents the percentage of patients who responded initially to the CAR-T therapy. The curve then slowly declined until it levels off at 40% at 24 months after CAR-T therapy, which represents the percentage of patients with a durable long-term survival. This table shows multivariate analysis of overall survival by Cox pro proportional ha hazard ratios. The presence of high disease burden, as defined by more than 5% lymphoblasts in the bone marrow, increases, increases the risk of inferior outcome by five-fold. These survival curves show that the subset of patients with a high disease burden, shown here in green, have a poorer survival in, in, in both ev event-free survival, shown on the, on the right side, and overall survival, shown on the left. This table shows the toxicity and, and treatments of, uh, associated with CAR-T therapy in the real-world setting. 63% of patients in the study develop any grade of cytokine release syndrome, whereas about 22% develop high-grade cytokine release syndrome. Uh, the, the next line is a typo there, but 21% of the uh, patients develop any grade of acute neurotoxicity, whereas 7% develop high-grade neurotoxicity. Cumulatively, 27% of patients need to receive tocilizumab treatment for uh, 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 the cytokine release syndrome, and 15% re needs to re uh, uh, receive steroid treatment for uh, 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 neurotoxicity. These numbers are comparable to the data obtained in the original Ileana study. Overall, real-world experience of the use of commercially available CAR T cells in pediatric ALL closely mirrors the finding of the Eliana trial, confirming the general applicability of CAR T therapy in children with ALL. As we recall from the data from the Eliana trial and real world uh, experience, about 85% of patients will, will go into remission after CAR T therapy but some of these patients will relapse within one year. 
Are there any clinical parameters that can predict which patients are likely to, re to, to relapse and would need consolidation with, for example, stem cell transplantation? Mike Pausifer and his group in Utah performed a study that sought an answer to this, sought to answer this question. Assaying for minimal residual disease by next generation sequencing is a highly sensitive way of detecting a very small number of residual leukemic cells in a patient's sample. Pulsifer's group looked at evidence for residual disease in 109 patients from the Ileana study and correlates the finding with clinical outcome. They look to see if there are any difference in survival between patients who are either positive or negative for M minimal residual disease as detected by next, gen next generation sequencing on day 28 using a cutoff threshold of one in a million. Surprisingly, as shown in the uh, uh, plot A on the left side, they found no difference between the two groups. However, when they modify the cutoff threshold to separate the patient into two groups that, are either that have either zero or non-zero minimal residual disease, they saw a huge difference in survival, as shown in, in pl uh, plot C. This, this difference was also seen when the assay was done at three or six months after CAR T infusion, as shown in plots E and G. These results show that detection of any non-zero minimal residual disease by next, genera next generation sequencing is a reliable pre a predictor for impending relapse and poor survival. Because CD19 antigen is present in both leukemia and uh, normal B cells, B cell aplasia is a universal side effect of the uh, CAR T therapy. Early B, B cell recovery is seen as a, predict, as a predictor of loss of T, T cell efficacy. Pulsifer and his group look at the combined effect of early B cell recovery and positive MRD by next generation sequencing. On day 28 after CAR T infusion, if a patient has zero MRD and persistent B cell aplasia, as shown by the cur uh, uh, black curve in the figure, the patient will have a good prognosis. If the patient has non-zero MRD and early B cell recovery, as shown by the blue curve, the patients will have a dismal prognosis. If the patient has a mixed picture, as shown by the green and red uh, as curves, the prognosis will be intermediate. On month three after CAR T infusion, having zero MRD alone, in re irrespective of the status of the B cell aplasia, as shown by the black and green curve, predicts a good prognosis. Whereas having non-zero MRD alone, as shown by the red and blue blue curves predicts a poor prognosis. This study carries some profound implication. Any positive MRD greater than zero, as, de as detected by uh, next generation sequencing, is highly associated with leukemia relapse and poor survival. At day 28 post CAR T E infusion, early B cell recovery and positive MRD by next generation sequencing together predict poor prognosis, whereas by month three after infusion of the CAR T cells, positive MRD alone would predict poor, uh, poor prognosis. These results emphasize the importance of monitoring MRD by next generation sequencing after CAR T therapy. A non-zero MRD result would indicate impending leukemia relapse and should prompt consideration of stem cell transplantation. Are there ways that can be pursued to improve on these results? How about targeting a different leukemia protein? A group at the National, uh, the National Cancer Institute has been studying CAR T cells that, that, CAR -T cells that target CD22 antigen another B cell marker. They look at a group of 58 ALL patients treated with CD22-directed CAR T cells. Most of these patients have been heavily pre-treated. 
88% have had prior CD19 CAR T therapy, 67% uh, have had prior uh, stem cell transplantation, 24% have had prior CD22 uh, directed in, in, in a tuzumab treatment, and 9% have had CD22 CAR T therapy. And 57% of the leukemia were CD19 negative or dimly positive. Re reflecting their, persist, uh, their resistance to CD19-based therapies. The plot on the left of the figure shows leukemia relapse after receiving CD22 CAR-T therapy. The field circles in, in indicate the time of relapse, and the purple square indicate the time of stem cell transplantation. Most pa patients initially show a response to CD19, uh, CD22-directed CAR-T therapy, but they relapse quickly. Stem cell transplantation might delay the, the relapse, but as indicated by the sharp drop in, in survival curve shown on the right-hand right side, effectiveness of CDD22-directed uh, CAR T cells appear to be short-lived, especially in these heavily pretreated patients. Nevertheless, the study shows that CD22-targeted CAR T cells could be a selfish therapy for patients resistant to CD19 therapies. Non-response of CD19-based therapy does not preclude response to uh, CD22 targeting. Further development of CD22-targeted uh, CAR T cells would be warranted. With this goal in mind, a group from Shanghai and St. Jude prepared a multicenter phase two clinical study examining the safety and efficacy of co-administration of CAR T cells targeting both the CD19 and CD22 antigens in children with relapsed ALL. The study looked at 225 patients, including 194 patients with hematological relapse and 31 patients with isolated extramedullary relapse. Strikingly, complete remission was achieved in 99% of the patients with hematological relapse and in all patients with extramedullary relapse. 12 month event free survival was 73%, which is about 20% higher than that seen in the Eliana's uh, uh, study. The survival rate was even more impressive if you take transplantation into account. The 12 month uh, event free survival was 69% for non transplanted patients and as high as, eight, as, high as 85% for transplanted patients. In terms of toxicity, Cytokine release syndrome developed in 88% of patients with 28% in high grade, and acute neurotoxicity developed in 21% with 4% in high grade. This figure shows survival of patients who have received the, the dual CD19, CD22 CAR T cells followed either by transplant or no transplant. There is clearly a survival advantage if patients receive stem cell transplant after CAR T therapy. Of note, the survival curve for the transplanted patients appears to have flattened after 12 months, suggesting that over 80% of the, of, of the patients might have been cured of their disease. This table shows multivariate analysis of 12-month 12, 12 event-free survival comparing the group without transplant with the group with transplant. In most of the groups, undergoing transplant appear to make a positive difference. In the second row, for, for, for example, for patients older than 10 years of age, transplant improves the survival from 55% to 91%. In the third row, transplant in the male patients improves, improves the survival from 66% to 83%. In the sixth row, with the patient in first relapse, transplant improves the survival from 68% to 89%. It will be critical to confirm these impressive findings in follow-up uh, studies. The, the, the data presented in this study convincingly show that co-administration of CD19 and CD22 22 CAR T cells could improve clinical outcome of patients with refractory ALL. The favorable outcome of the study could be attributed to early eradication of leukemia clones from co-administrations of two types of CAR T cells, rapid production of CAR T cells 
taking only one week to complete, and infusion of fresh CAR T, CAR -T cells products. Limitation of the study include the decision to undergo transplantation is not well controlled, and the MRD evaluation was not done by the a next generation sequencing approach. We eagerly await follow-ups uh, of this study, hoping that the same promising results would be re replicated in other studies. In conclusion, the ability of CD19 CAR T cells to, to bring re relapse and refractory B cell ALL into complete remission has been confirmed by updates of the ELIANA trials and by real-world clinical data. Up to 50% of CAR T treated patients, however, could have disease relapse within 12 months. Continued B cells aplasia and absence MLD by next, gener next generation sequencing are good predictor of persistent effectiveness of CAR T therapy, potentially obviating the need for stem cell transplant. The use of CD22 directed CAR T cells in conjunction with CD19 directed CAR T cells could offer an, an approach to improve clinical effectiveness of CAR T therapy. There's much more to learn, but with no doubt, CAR T therapy has become an e essential tool in our fight against leukemia and other malignancies. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Oh. Uh, so, Dr. C, talk. Yes, we follow the MLD by the next, gener next generation sequencing closely. It's an expensive test, but it's worth it. And then we, we follow it uh, 28 days uh, after transplantation, three months, six months. And then if it has any indication it's positive. Please use the microphone. Transplantation. Yeah. That answer your question, right? Yeah, so, so we do, do, do apply it clinically. Do we have any other questions for Dr. C? Thank you so much, Thank sir. Thank you. Just a reminder to our virtual attendees to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Now to start session 2C, myelodysplastic syndromes, is Kristen Thompson, nurse practitioner. Kristen Thompson has been with Norton Cancer Institute and Norton Women and Children's Hospital since 2011. She received her Master's of Science in Nursing from Eastern Kentucky University. Kristen is an advanced practice provider and has served as a sub-investigator with multiple hematologic and oncologic malignancy clinical trials and presented at several tumor boards. Welcome, Kristen Thompson. All right. Good afternoon. So um, today we'll just be spending a few minutes to talk about the 2020 updates in myelodysplastic syndromes. These are my disclosures and learning objectives for today. So myelodysplastic syndromes are a heterogeneous group of clonal disorders of the hematopoietic stem cell system. They present with a variable degree of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia. The natural history of MDS has this invariable tendency to progress to leukemia. There were some recent updates based on who classification, how MDS is diagnosed. Patients must still have persistent cytopenias. However, the threshold for those is a little less stringent. Um, so women now have to have a hemoglobin less than 12, men hemoglobin less than 13, and platelet count less than 100. We must still exclude any other causes of cytopenias, um, including comorbidities, medications, um, and nutritional deficiencies. And patients must still have the MDS major criteria. We're going to evaluate that through a bone marrow biopsy, looking not only for blast count and dysplasia, but also now looking at morphologic changes and cytogenetic abnormalities. 
So 2022 introduced us to um, updates in WHO classification as well as the International Chamber of Comber Commerce classification system. The WHO, place, WHO based classification system um, has been long available for myeloid neoplasms, including MDS, but was recently updated to the uh, fifth edition. A new classification system for MDS was recently published, the ICC. Both classification systems are currently being used um, in practice. However, they do differ a little in how they define certain aspects of MDS. For example, the ICC does not include MDS with ring sideroblasts as a morphologic category, um, and the nomenclature of MDS with excess blasts differs between the two. So this can definitely um, provide some confusion in this area. So the Moffitt Cancer Center um, recently set out and did a single center retrospective study of um, over 2,000 MDS patients. These patients were reclassified to the WHO at an ICC um, to validate these two classification systems. The updates in the classification systems mainly focused on identification of genetically defined groups based on the presence of TP53, deletion 5Q, and SF3B1 mutate SF3B1 abnormalities. Um, and it was apparent, as you can see here, that both classification systems uh, function very well in terms of correlation between the subgroups and the median leukemia-free survival and median overall survival. This is data based on a single center, but hopefully does provide a roadmap for going forward to potentially reunify our classification systems. As we just discussed, oncogenic gene mutations are very important in MDS. Currently, currently, we know of over 40 somatic mutations. However, only five to six of these mutations occur in more than 10% of cases. More than 90% of patients with MDS will present with at least one mutation. However, we know on average, most patients will have three to four of these. The realization of the importance of these molecular mutations um, is not only being integrated within our classification system, but also now our risk stratification uh, system as well. So currently, when we risk stratify our patients with MDS, we are using the International Prognostic Scoring System revised. This was uh, revised in 2012 to include these cytogenetic groups that you can see here on the bottom. We now have the International um, prognostic storing system molecular, um, the IPSSM. This is a newly developed risk stratification system. It used data from over 3,711 patients to develop and subsequently validate this system. So it uses not only blood counts, marrow blasts, and those five IPSSR cytogenetic categories, but also 16 main effect genes, 15 residual genes. TP Three, TP53 multi-hit FLT3 mutation and MLLPTD uh, were strong predictor, predictors of adverse outcomes as we expected, really highlighting the importance of screening for these mutations. IPSSM resulted in improve, improved prognostic accuracy across all long-term clinical endpoints, and of the 3,711 patients who were included, nearly half were re-stratified. Now we'll focus on lower risk MDS. Nearly two -third thirds of patients who are initially um, diagnosed are diagnosed in this category. Patients with lower risk MDS are primarily candidates for treatments aimed at improving cytopenias and quality of life. Almost 90% of patients diagnosed with lower risk MDS do present with anemia, which has limited treatment options. ESAs are typically our first line of therapy. However, we know primary resistance and loss of response to these is very common. Loose powder sept is now FDA approved after um, ESA failure. We also currently have len lenalidomide, which is approved for patients with deletion 5Q who are transfusion dependent. We know that um, our, historically our patients who are non-transfusion dependent have not been included in our lower risk clinical trials. However, these patients do still present with anemia and are symptomatic to that. So how can we help these patients? The Centra Rev was a phase three multi-center clinical trial which randomized patients who had deletion 5Q 
um, but were not transfusion dependent, but still had symptomatic anemia. They were randomized to low-dose lenalidomide at five milligrams daily versus placebo for a limited treatment time of two years. The primary endpoint, as we can see here, is time to transfusion dependency, um, which was longer in the lenalidomide arm and has not reached its cutoff at more than six years compared to 11 months with placebo. Lenalidomide um, also reduced the risk of transfusion dependency by almost 70%, and those patients who were treated with lenalidomide, 94% of those had a cytogenetic response of clearing that deletion 5Q. It was um, well tolerated with an acceptable safety profile. There was no increased risk to um, progression to leukemia, and it did not promote clonal evolution, specifically in our TP53 patients. This does warrant, I think, consideration of treating our patients who have symptomatic anemia but are not transfusion dependent in that low risk MDS category. Overall survival has also really been assessed in our patients with lower risk MDS, despite a previous analysis highlighting the impact of treatment on factors influencing overall survival. Although the Metalist trial, which gained loose powder septic FDA approval, was not specifically powered to assess overall survival or progression-free survival, this data does show that achieving response with loose powder sept increased overall survival probability. Loose powder sept was associated with an increased 36-month overall survival probability in our very low-risk MDS patients and a 36-month progression-free survival possibility for patients who had a baseline CRM EPO of 100 to 200. Therefore, patients with low-risk MDS and these baseline characteristics may derive a greater survival benefit with loose powder set. Future studies with longer follow-up time um, will hopefully help clarify this and will hopefully help move loose powder step into that frontline setting eventually. Now moving on to high-risk MDS. For more than a decade now, hypomethylating agents, azacitidine and decitabine um, have been our standard of care for this patient population. Response to these agents only occur in about 50% of patients, and duration of response is variable, um, but typically not well-maintained with only six to 24 months. We continue to attempt to add to HMAs, um, but many of those have, uh, most of those have not gained FDA approval as they do not approve overall survival versus a monotherapy. Today, I'll spend just a few minutes talking about two that are currently in phase three trial. Um, again, trying to add to HMAs to improve that overall survival. So the first one is megrolimab. Megrolimab is a monoclonal antibody that blocks cluster of differentiation 47. This is a don't eat me signal that's overexpressed on cancer cell. By blocking this, it promotes macrophage-mediated phagocytosis of tumor cells and is synergistic with the azacitidine that it's being given with which increases expression of the eat me signal. Here you can see phase 1b data. Um, this study enrolled 95 previously untreated, intermediate, high, or very high risk MDS patients. They received megrolimab plus azacitidine. The swimmer plot here shows response over time, treatment duration, and next treatment initiation for these patients who received a complete remission. Complete re response rates were about 33% and an overall response rate around 75%. On the y-axis there, maybe you can see, um, patients who had TP53 mutation there at the very top of the plot there. Um, we know historically these patients are harder to manage, um, but you can see there that more than 40% 40% of these um, achieved a complete response with a median overall survival being 16.3 months. It was well tolerated and shows some promising efficacy, so there is an ongoing phase three study, the enhanced trial, which will hopefully um, confirm this information. Next is azacitidine in combination with Vinclexta for our um, higher risk MDS patients. I think we're all familiar with venetoclax at this point in time. It is a BCL2 inhibitor that's currently has an FDA approval for our CLL and AML patient population. So this study looked at treatment naive high risk MDS patients um, that had Vinclexta in combination with azacitidine. They can, had a combined complete remission and narrow complete uh, remission rate of 79%. 
A large phase two study went on to show an overall survival rate of around 80 and a complete response rate of around 35. This was across molecular alterations, including TP53. It again showed, um, demonstrated a manageable safety profile. To confirm these studies, the Verona study is ongoing and will hopefully broaden our therapeutic options. I did want to highlight the current clinical trials that we have here at Norton Cancer Institute. You can see here that they are for our relapse refractory and high risk setting. Um, our high risk MDS patients who really kind of lack any um, additional treatment options. In conclusion today, MDS definitely constitutes for a highly diverse group of disorders. Frontline treatment strategies continue to aim to improve cytopenias and patients' quality of life. Where those high-risk patients, our goal is to um, prevent AML progression and prolong survival rates. In cases when patients are not suitable for transplant, second-line therapies um, are really strictly dependent on a reassessment of their cytogenetics and molecular alterations, as well as in ensuring there has not been any clonal evolution in these patients. Enrollment in clinical trials continue to be imperative while we um, await for the final results of ongoing studies, which very, hopefully very soon will broaden the therapeutic possibilities for our MDS patients. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions for Kristen? Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have one more session before the next break, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Our speaker, Dr. Terrence Hadley, has been a staff physician with Norton Healthcare at the Norton Cancer Institute for over 20 years. He has special expertise in benign hematology and also chronic leukemia and low and intermediate grade lymphomas. He obtained his MD degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He completed his internship, residency, and fellowship training at the University of Florida. Dr. Hadley then spent a year practicing clinical medicine in Nigeria. This was followed by a research position at the National Institutes of Health and Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, where he did research on identifying red cell receptors for malaria parasites and malaria parasite receptors for the red cell. Dr. Hadley later joined the faculty at the University of Louisville's James Graham Brown Cancer Center, where he helped characterize the Duffy red cell antigen as a receptor for certain chemotactic cytokines. He subsequently joined Norton Healthcare in the Norton Cancer Institute, where he has practiced clinical hematology oncology and participated in clinical research and teaching. Welcome, Dr. Hadley. So the topic um, is a kind of a rare disorder called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, somewhat difficult to say. Um, we nickname it HLH. I uh, have no disclosures. Um, so the definition is, it's a syndrome characterized by, by very severe immune activation and really a failure of immune downregulation. Uh, it's characterized by a cytokine storm, increased levels of interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, and other cytokines. Uh, it leads to multi-organ damage. It's uh, often triggered by infection, malignancy, rheumatologic diseases. Uh, when it's triggered by a rheumatologic disease, it's often called macrophage activation syndrome. Um, especially in the pediatric population, uh, there have been defects in genes uh, that are related to the perforin granzyme pathway. Um, and I'll go into that just a little bit further. So this is the kind of molecular basis for this disorder in uh, childhood. Uh, the childhood picture is a little bit different from the adult picture in general. but. Cytotoxic T, uh, T lymphocytes and natural killer cells have granules that contain cytolytic proteolytic enzymes called granzymes. And T cells and natural killer cells form attachments with target cells, and these attachments are called immune synapses. The target cells can be uh, cells that are infected, for example, with pathogens. They can be neoplastic cells or sometimes just overly active uh, macrophages that need to be downregulated. The, the uh, granules of the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and natural killer cells contain a molecule called perforin, which disrupts the target cell membranes 
And then granzymes, which are proteolytic enzymes, are injected more or less into the uh, target cell, and this leads to apoptosis of the target cell, which is a programmed cell death. Um, the immune cell target cell interaction leads to ap apoptosis and downregulation regu down of both the target cell and downregulation of the effector cell. Once the granules are released, the effector cells get downregulated themselves. So failure of this interaction leads to persistently activated immune cells and ultimately leads to a cytokine storm. This is a cartoon. Uh, on the top in the green is the effector cell. That could be a cytotoxic T cell or a natural killer cell. It has um, um, a granule containing perforin uh, and then uh, containing also a granzyme, the proteolytic enzymes. Um, an attachment forms with the target cell, the lower, lower cell, that's beige, and um, it's called a synapse, uh, an immune synapse and uh, then the uh, granule is released. Perforin perforates the membrane and granzyme enters the cell and leads to program uh, cell death. Um, I must say that when I first started learning about these pathways, I thought, gosh, um, if there's a defect in the cytotoxic T lymphocyte in the natural killer cell, if they can't release their granules, wouldn't that lead to uh, immune suppression rather than activation? But what happens is with once once the effector cell releases a granule, it becomes downregulated. It stops secreting cytokines. And if the uh, target cell cannot be deactivated or cannot go through apoptosis, that target cell, for example, a macrophage, will continue to overexpress cytokines. So defects in this pathway can lead to cytokine storm. Um, there are a number of genes associated with um, HLH. Uh, this is particularly important in childhood HLH where um, the patients tend to be homozygous for either one gene or uh, compound heterozygous. PRF1 is the perforin gene. That's the classic gene that was first described. But there are other genes that, have, uh, that, that code proteins that are important in granule formation and granule um, uh, trafficking and granule release. And all, uh, defects in any of these genes can lead uh, to HLH. Um, the literature divides HLH into primary and secondary. There is some overlap. So primary HLH is the disease that we see in infancy and childhood, and it is characterized by homozygosity or compound heterozygosity for the genes in the perforin uh, gran granzyme pathway. Homozygosity, of course, is if you get uh, one gene for the perforin mutation from mom and one gene from dad, so now you have two. Compound heterozygosity is you get one gene from mom and a, maybe a different gene from dad, um, and then you're compound heterozygous. Um, primary a HLH is sometimes associated with immune disorders in childhood, um, and secondary HLH presents in adulthood. There is some crossover, about 27% of adults with HLH have been described as being heterozygous for one of the gene mutations rather than homozygous, which we see in children. The adult HLH is often associated with malignancies, infections, and autoimmune disorders. Um, in adult HLH, the diseases that we see associated with it, about 52% of the time, uh, malignancies, Infections of various types, about 34%. Oftentimes, these are intracellular organisms uh, causing the infection that inhabit the macrophage. The macrophage gets activated, and um, then the effector cell is supposed to attack that infected macrophage. Um, and when that attack mechanism doesn't worth, work, the effector cell stays activated, and the uh, target cell, cell stays activated. Autoimmune diseases are classic for what's called by the rheumatologist the macrophage activation syndrome, which is really HLH in the setting of an autoimmune disease, Stills disease, or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is the most common and classic. About, in adulthood, about 6% of the HLH um, is idiopathic, and a syndrome very similar to HLH, cytokine storm syndrome, uh, is seen with CAR-T and bite therapy. Um, in terms of the malignancies that are associated with HLH, 35% uh, are T-cell lymphomas, 32% B-cell lymphomas, 
uh, 20% leukemias and MDS, and there are a variety of other malignancies. What are the clinical findings of HLH? And here it gets difficult because you see a lot of this is nonspecific, and it's very difficult sometimes to recognize the pattern and to have that light bulb go over, uh, light up that says, gosh, maybe this is HLH. 95% um, fever, 89% splenomegaly, um, cytopenias can be present um, in 92%. Um, a couple of unusual things, hypertriglyceridemia is, uh, is kind of a classic finding, hypofibrinogenemia, which can occur, of course, in DIC, but also is seen in HLH. And oftentimes, a tri trigger to a hematologist rounding on these patients is an elevated ferritin, but it's often not just above 500. It's often 10,000, 20,000, 80,000. That's oftentimes what triggers a hematologist to think, hey, maybe this is HLH. Um, there's absent um, cytokine, natural killer cell activity, as I pointed out in the cartoon, that uh, release of the granules does not work. Um, we do have an assay for that. Uh, it's in EPIC. If you type in NK activity, you'll get it. Um, the turnaround time on that is a bit long. Um, and also classic and very important in the diagnosis of HLH is there's an increase in um, the IL-2 receptor. That's called CD25, so soluble uh, CD25 is an important test to order if you uh, uh, suspect HLH. Other clinical manifestations, abnormal liver function tests, elevated D-dimer, DIC, neurologic symptoms can be present, PRES, uh, posterior uh, encephalopathy syndrome, headache, visual disturbances, respiratory abnormalities, hypertension, or dysfunction. But again, these things are very nonspecific and be, can be seen, for example, in sepsis. So we have to um, keep LH sort of in the back of our minds uh, and think of it when it might be appropriate. Um, now, HLH was first described and is more often found in uh, children, and so the Histiocyte Society has focused on childhood HLH and uh, came up with the diagnostic criteria. Um, there are eight different things to look for, and we have to have five or more to make the diagnosis. That's fever, splenomegaly, cytopenias, hypertriglyceridemia, and then hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow, lymph node, or liver. Um, that hemophagocytosis for which the syndrome is named is actually present in only about 50% of patients. So we can certainly make the diagnosis of HLH in the absence of hemophagocytosis. Uh, ferritin level of greater than 500, but often it's up in the 10,000, 20,000 range. Soluble um, uh, IL-2 receptor, low NK activity. We can order both the soluble IL-2 receptor in EPIC. Uh, the turnaround is fairly quick. It's about three days. Now, low, low NK activity takes longer. Um, another scoring system you can have on your phone is called uh, the H-score. Uh, it can be Googled very easily. I kind of like this scoring system a little bit better because it, can, it gives you different levels of various uh, clinical findings. For example, different levels of the temperature, um, organomegaly, number of cytopenias, different levels of the ferritin, um, different levels of uh, triglycerides and fibrinogen and so forth. A cutoff score of 169 or greater corresponds to a 93% sensitivity and an 86% specificity uh, for HLH. Uh, this is a picture of a macrophage in the bone marrow. It's engulfing a neutrophil or a band. Uh, again, uh, that's fairly classic, uh, but it's only found in about 50% um, of cases. I find it's uh, important to talk to the pathologist when you suspect, or if you suspect HLH, to have the pathologist look carefully for hemophagocytosis. Um, tests we order in HLH, um, a lot of these tests will be ordered anyway in a patient that has this kind of clinical picture. Oftentimes it looks like uh, sepsis. Um, uh, I, in the adult HLH especially, uh, a fairly uh, Good workup for an underlying infection, I think, is important, um, and that includes fungal infections, rickettsial infections, tick panels. Dr. Glisson tells me uh, downtown at Norton Downtown, he's diagnosed HLH in a patient with a tick-borne disease or lichiosis, um, and then the various viruses we are seeing or we saw um, during uh, 
the COVID epidemic, um, HLH uh, associated with COVID, uh, where the ferritin levels are very high. And, um, I usually look for a vasculitis uh, in these patients because oftentimes they look septic, they, they have a multi-system illness, but the cultures might be negative, so looking for a vasculitis is another rule-out endeavor. But again, the soluble IL-2 receptor is important, and th there's another soluble receptor called CD163, which is a hemoglobin haptoglobin scavenger receptor that's also elevated, although it's not part of the diagnostic criteria. If the patients have neurologic symptoms, of course, uh, examination of the CSF is important, and gene tests uh, can be uh, ordered, although the turnaround time on those uh, is long, um, especially in the younger people, the teenagers or the children with HLH, HLA typing is important because the patients may need a bone marrow transplant. Um, so if we do recognize it, and I think it's probably under-recognized um, in the adults, uh, the pediatricians are very good at recognizing it. Um, but if we do recognize it, um, what do we do about it? Um, HLH, in my way of thinking, is a little bit more like a syndrome than a specific disease. You have the childhood HLH, which is clearly, or most oftentimes, clearly associated with the genetic mutations. The adult HLH can be associated with heterozygosity of a genetic mutation about 27% of the time, but often, most of the time, we don't identify a genetic mutation that's often associated with uh, malignancies or in, in infections. Um, so if the patient, so the treatments can be a little bit different depending on the clinical picture and the clinical context. Um, if the patient is stable and they have an infection, it's best to start by treating the infection. Um, for example, EB virus with rituximab, uh, antiretroviral agents for HIV, um, and of course uh, treating COVID, which is uh, treated um, oftentimes with antibiotics and antiviral medications and also dexamethasone. But um, if the patient has a rheumatologic disease and the diagnosis of HLH is made, um, then we institute steroids and anakinra, which is an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. Um, there, is some, uh, there is some interest in very small case report type studies on ruxolitinib, which is Jacophy, because that inhibits the JAK-STAT pathway, which is an inflammatory pathway inhibitor. Um, then we, uh, if the patient is stable with an underlying malignancy, I think it's uh, important first to treat the malignancy. Um, some authors will suggest if it's a lymphoma, perhaps consider including VP16. Um, if the patient is unstable, and it's important when you see the patient, if you suspect HLH, make the diagnosis, start the treatment, but then we monitor the ferritin levels and the D-dimer levels and the clinical scenario. Um, if the patient progressively gets worse, we uh, use an HLH-94 uh, protocol, um, which I'll show you in a moment, but, it can, uh, but it, it's chemotherapy consisting of high-dose dexamethasone and VP16. Um, if the patient has neurologic symptoms, LPs are warranted and also intrathecal methotrexate. Um, the HLH-94 protocol, um, it's a while back that they put this protocol together. Uh, they tried to update it in 2004, but it, it, the 2004 protocol was not better. So oftentimes, uh, pediatricians especially will use the 94 protocol. But it, it includes um, atopicide VP16 twice weekly for two weeks, followed by, week, uh, by VP16 weekly for six weeks for an eight-week induction phase. Dexamethasone at pretty high levels, 10 milligrams daily for two weeks, followed by five milligrams daily for two weeks, followed by 2.5 daily for two weeks, and so forth. Intrathecal methotrexate is used if indicated. Um, and then that induction phase is followed by a continuation phase uh, using a high-dose dexamethasone every two weeks and atopicide every two weeks, and also um, the anti-T-cell drug, cyclosporin or tacrolimus. Um, despite this treatment, by the way, the, even in childhood, HLH, unfortunately, the um, mortality is still high. Um, that's about 40%. Um, in children with HLH, and documented homozygosity, the relapse rate would be so high following the chemotherapy that patients often go on uh, to uh, bone marrow transplant uh, up front. Um, and that's really the only curative therapy for childhood HLH. Um, 
bone marrow transplant is kind of reserved for adults um, who do not achieve a complete remission with first-line therapy. Um, there are se some second-line therapies that are used now, but it's less often that we would go to transplant uh, in an adult where we have the option of treating an infection, treating a malignancy, treating uh, a rheumatologic disease, and so forth. Um, there are no large series on HLH in adults, uh, unfortunately. Um, a lot of this stuff is very small, limited uh, numbers of patients described in the literature. But the, um, addition, the medications that are being um, tested now include alamtuzumab and then the interferon gamma neutralizing antibody, emipalumab. Now, emipalumab is the um, only medication approved by the FDA specifically for the treatment of HLH, and that was approved in 2018. The study was 34 patients. Um, uh, it was an international study from Germany, Italy, Spain, the United States. Uh, there was, a, it was in children who um, did not respond well to the chemotherapy, and it was, almost, it was used almost as a bridge to bone marrow transplant, and it had about a 64% uh, response rate and about a 20% complete response rate in children with HLH. In adults with HLH, especially those with rheumatologic illnesses, there's uh, and, uh, a lot of interest now in looking at ruxolitinib, uh, which inhibits the JAK-SNAP pathway and the inflammatory pathway. Okay, so these are uh, concluding thoughts about HLH. Um, I think the major thought is that we need to think about it because we, I think we're, we're missing it. And again, it's a syndrome uh, in the adult uh, patients rather than a specific disease, but it does um, lead to a, a, a different forms of therapy that may be important. As I think uh, the delay in diagnosis is what's been uh, uh, detrimental to patient care. So think about HLH in patients with unexplained fevers, unexplained cytopenia, splenomegaly, elevated ferritins, septic appearing patients with negative cultures. Think about HLH in patients with infections who appear to, getting, to be getting sicker than expected on, or not improving on therapy. Check ferritin levels on patients who have unexplained fever and who look septic but have negative cultures. The ferritin levels are often very high. That can be a tip off. Considering, order, uh, consider, uh, ordering IL-2 receptor uh, lipid profiles and fibrinogen in such patients. Uh, ask the pathologist to specifically look for hemophagocytosis in the bone marrow and try to avoid a delay in the diagnosis as this can adversely affect outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hadley. Do we have any questions for Dr. Hadley about HLH? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hadley. Great talk. Um, I noticed that you uh, really sort of hit on the fact that soluble CD25 is a big sort of biomarker in this disease. Has basiliximab ever been considered? Basiliximab, the anti-CD25 um, uh, transplant inducer. Oh, the one that's used in um, for cytokine storm? Yes. Yes, yes. Um, you know, it's, uh, that's the, probably the agent of choice if there's an HLH-like syndrome in the setting of uh, CAR T cells or bite cells, Those, yeah. I, I, it, it, I, I did not see it, oddly enough, in uh, HLH associated with Stills disease or infections, but certainly in the CAR T setting or the bite setting, it's the go-to medication, uh, uh, steroids, and tocilizumab, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Hadley.